Amen, amen. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, you are all the person I think about. You are my peace, you are my joy. You are all that I need. On this note, I welcome you back to our study on the book of Nehemiah, which we have dubbed Excellence in leadership leadership is in the air almost every company every organization every institution talks about leadership consequently many think that to be a leader is to attend a leadership seminar or webinar or training or perhaps get some certificate or a degree in leadership or even a business degree from, let's say, London School of Business or Oxford Business School or any of the business schools. And once you have a degree, that necessarily translates into you being a leader. For some, leadership is giftedness. You have some unique abilities, natural abilities or charisma, or even age, simply because you are old or because you are young, you are considered a leader. In many cases, many think you are a leader simply because you've been elected or appointed or that you occupy a position of responsibility. But none of these makes a person a leader. In the Bible, Leaders are called by God, equipped and prepared to accomplish a unique task. It is a calling. It is not a part-time work that you can put aside and take at another time. No, it is a lifelong calling. And so this week, by studying God's word, we are seeking to understand the hallmarks of a true leader. 
We have talked about the calling of a leader in chapter one of the book of Nehemiah. How a crisis or a need becomes the occasion when God calls people to leadership. So look around you. Whenever you see a need, whenever there is crisis, it is time or it is the right moment when God would raise you up to do something. Chapter 2 of Nehemiah is the planning of a leader, how a leader plans his work. Details are important. You pray, but you plan. You plan and you pray. And we saw Nehemiah at work. For those four months, as he was praying, he was also researching, planning, calculating. How much time would I need? What resources would I need? How would I motivate the people? What would I do when I get there? The planning of a leader. Nehemiah chapter 3 is how a leader works his plan, how he executes his work. It is not enough to plan and put something on paper and PowerPoint and nice you know, proposals. You must be able to deliver. And this involves your ability to mobilize people so that you can accomplish a desired goal. And we saw Nehemiah magnificently at work, strategically placing people near their homes, near their workplace. This will cut down commutation to work and back. It also ensured that people will build very well because if you are building near your house, you wouldn't do a lousy job. Nehemiah used all the people with all their gifts and abilities, little children, boys and girls, people from all over. And we also discovered the attitude of some workers. Whereas some work very hard doing double or triple jobs, there are others who thought they were smart enough they would do no job at all. God records all our activities in the way we work. What is significant in chapter 3 is Nehemiah gave credit to all the people who work, hence he listed them and their names, where they came from. But his name never appeared. Leaders don't take credit unto themselves. They render the credit to the workers. In chapter 4, we see Nehemiah leading the group as they worked under fierce opposition, external opposition. And yet he prevailed. No matter what the enemies threw at him, he prayed and he continued working. He never stopped. Prayer was the engine that drove Nehemiah, but he never quit working. Prayer and waiting, prayer and working, and prayer all the way through everything he did. And yesterday, we talked about how a leader deals with internal conflict. In this case, it almost blew up the entire place. Everyone was affected. And Nehemiah, was obviously very, very upset. He said, I was angry, very angry. We've got to be angry when things are not going well. But let's not allow the anger to hold us or dictate what we do. Nehemiah said, I gave advice to myself. I pondered over those things. And he carefully mapped out a course of action. He talked to the people involved confronted them privately. And once it was clear, he said, your actions have become public. I'm going to make it public. Pulled an assembly together and then confronted them and exacted a commitment with a legally binding document and then also judgment from God when they broke it. And it was pleasing to everyone. But a leader does not solve problems. He also put structures in place so that that kind of problem will not recur again. And it is in that that we saw the character of Nehemiah image. Selfless, dedicated, 
self-sacrificing. And once again, he concluded with his prayer, remember me, O Lord. Today, we are going to enter into another fascinating account. This is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 6. We are going to talk about how a leader deals with personal attack. How leaders deal with personal attack. There's a statement by Ellen White from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 136. She says, When the religion of Christ is held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. Our test is going to be when champions are few, God is going to raise up a people who will stand in defense of truth and righteousness. In fact, she goes on to say, at this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others and courage from their cowardice. And we must gather loyalty from their treason. We need leaders who are uncompromising. And today, we are going to see Nehemiah at work, despite attack on him. You see, God's blessings are always met by Satan's anger. And our successes almost always provoke opposition. It is one thing to start or get something started. It is another thing to keep going. True leader, true leaders, leaders who excel need great courage when the going gets tough. And in the book of Nehemiah, God shows us that the people who are building the broken walls are going to face some formidable and determined enemies who are symbolized by Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the Asdodite. In case you have a map of Palestine, let's say my palm is Palestine, Judah. Israel. On the north is Samaria, and the leader of that region at that time was Sambalat. Then on the east, where the Ammonites lived, their leader was Tobiah, enemy number two. Then enemy number three was in the south, among the Arabs. His name was Geshem, or sometimes Gashmu. And then on the west, along the Mediterranean coast, where the Philistines lived, were the Ashdodites, the Ashdodite people from Ashdod. So Israel was surrounded by enemies in the north, Sambalat, enemies in the east, Tobiah, in the south, Geshem, and then on the west, by Ashdod. Though Satan is plainly out of sight, he was actually the adversary. He was behind the opposition by all these enemies who surrounded Israel. And Satan uses human agents to deceive, to discourage, to attack the progress of God's cause. The book of Nehemiah can thus be read as the unfolding drama of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, between right and wrong. 
And this controversy, which is playing out between God's people and Satan's agents, is also playing out in our personal lives. And so today, what we are going to do, even before we get into chapter 6, is to track down wherever Tobiah, Sambala, Geshem, wherever they appear, we are going to look at it carefully. Because we are going to discover that at every stage of the work, the enemies come with a plan. And Nehemiah and his people defeat them. And yet he comes up with another plan. How does Satan work? We'll begin by looking at it. But before we get into the word, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, all around us are enemies. And Satan has set traps for each one of us that we would fail. But we thank you that relentless as the enemy is, you are equally determined and passionate, eager that we succeed. Tonight, as we continue with our study, open our minds and open our eyes to see things we haven't perhaps noticed and speak to us in a very unique way. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sambalat in the north, Tobiah in the east, Geshem in the south, and then the Philistines, the Ashdodites, on the west. They were very relentless in the attack of Nehemiah and his people. And by studying them, we are going to discover the methods that Satan uses to keep God's people from doing God's will. So if you are taking notes, let's flip backwards. The first time the Bible records the names of Tobiah, Sambalat, and the rest is in Nehemiah chapter 2. When God called Nehemiah to do the work, after he had secured the resources from the king, the Bible tells us, as he journeyed from Susan, Persia, to Jerusalem, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, we read, When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Notice Nehemiah had not even arrived at Jerusalem yet. And the enemy was upset. Jealousy, envy, the fear of losing their power. All of these stirred these powers that were entrenched over there. I want to emphasize, the enemy's attack and displeasure begins as soon as he sees or hears that somebody has arisen to seek the welfare of God's people. Anytime the Lord lays a burden on your heart which would address a problem, Satan is going to be mad. Anytime you decide to be a Christian and you stand up, I surrender to the Lordship of Christ and you begin the journey of the Christian life, Satan is mad because he knows that a prey has escaped his grip and that through you, many lives are going to be impacted. It didn't end there. The next time we come across this Sambalat and his gang was when Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem. He surveyed the scene and then called all the people together, rallied them together. God has given us the power, the resources. We can do it. Let's rise and build. Come, let us build. And all the people were roused and they all said, yes, let us rise. We will build. As soon as Satan heard this, through his agents in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says, But when Sambala the Horonite, 
Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab head of it, they laughed us. At, they laughed at us and despised us. What is this thing you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Scorn, mockery, derision is one of the things Satan uses. As soon as you are set, ready to go, let's say you are going to start a business, you pull all the pieces together and Satan notices, wait a minute, this brother, this sister is about to get started. He is mad. But the way he translates his anger is by laughing at us, by despising us, making us feel that what you are about to do is foolish. It will not work. It is impossible. It is unrealistic. And then when he says, you are rebelling against the king, you, you are trying to rise up against the status quo. Satan will come at you. The good news is, how did Nehemiah respond? Whereas Sambala, Tobe, and the rest, you know, spoke of an earthly king. You are rebelling against the king. Nehemiah responded with the God of heaven. He will prosper us. Nehemiah 2.20, as the NIV put it, the God of heaven will give us success. And so in chapter 3, Nehemiah rallies the people together and they start building boys, girls, women, children, perfume makers, uh, Levi's, every walk of life. They started building. And once Satan got to know, once the enemy saw that, wait a minute, these brothers, these sisters are that serious, they came at him again. In chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. But it so happened. When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was very furious and very indignant, and he mocked the Jews. He was very furious. You know, one of the end time characteristics of God's end time church. They keep the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus, and the spirit of prophecy. And the Bible says the remnant, the enemy, the adversary, the dragon was wrath was angry. Satan is always angry at God's own. Here, the work has begun. What he, he tried to stop them with derision, sarcasm, mockery. It didn't stop them. They started building and everyone was putting their hands to the plow and they came at them. Angry. They mocked them. What are you feeble Jews trying to do? Feeble. You incompetent group of people. Are you trying to fortify yourselves? Are you going to offer sacrifices? What an absurdity into thinking prayers can cause stones or walls to come up. Will you complete it in a day? Think. This work has been there for 164 years. No one can do it. From the way you are working, as if you want to finish this work in a day. Will you revive the stone? I mean, he mocked them. Ridicule, contempt, discouragement. It was a psychological warfare. Once you begin also in your Christian walk and Satan discovers, look, you are serious. This brother, this sister is dead serious. They've left the world behind. Then they come at you. They laugh at you, you feeble Jews. They point to your weaknesses. Are you who have failed in the past? What makes you think you are going to do it? All these are calculated to put you down, to lower your self-esteem, to weaken your resolve so as to destroy your morale in the work. He wants to call attention to your weaknesses. But friends, do what Nehemiah did. How did Nehemiah handle this? The Bible tells us in chapter 4, he prayed, he committed his case to God, let God deal with the enemies, and he kept working. And so the work which started suddenly start growing. By the time you come to Nehemiah chapter 4, we come to the middle of the building. If you read verse 6 of Nehemiah 4, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. Now that the building has come to half the height, 
you think Satan will stop? Initially, he thought they could not even continue or get started. Now they are building, and it is halfway, and he came with another plan. Instead of a psychological warfare, now it was direct attack, physical attack. If you read from verse 7 of Nehemiah 4, now it happened. When Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arab, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites had the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Expect that in your workplace or in your personal life with the people surrounding you. Once they see that you have genuinely began and the Lord is blessing you slowly you are making progress he's angry he would work through agencies conspiring together to attack you and create confusion and if you read the account he started discouraging them and everyone was afraid how does Nehemiah deal with situations of this kind how should you deal with this situation he prayed and he continued working. And so the work that had laid in ruins for 160 plus years started gaining life. It started growing. We are now halfway through. And then, just before even they got towards the finish line, yesterday we discovered Satan hit again. Though his name is not mentioned, though Sambalat, Tobah, Geshem is not mentioned in chapter 5, the Bible refers to them as our enemies in verse 9. So they were working behind the scene. So the conflict, the protest, the, the, the outcry that took place when people, because of selfish interest, were exploiting others, were actually orchestrated by Satan. He made money an issue. Ultimately, it was selfishness. Today, we are going to watch. The building has now grown beyond halfway and is just about to be completed. Almost done. And you think Satan would quit? He never quit. So Nehemiah chapter 6, which is what we are going to study, we are going to watch how Satan works when we are almost there. When success is just, you know, at our fingertips, when we have almost arrived, how does Satan work? And then later on, because we are going to discover in this chapter, Nehemiah got the work done in 52 days. And then he governed the nation for 12 years. And then at the end of the 12th year, he went back to Persia to report to the king as he had requested. You think Satan would quit? He never quit. When Nehemiah was gone, he came back. I'm talking about Tobiah, Sambalat, and Geshem. They came back and infiltrated the ranks of the people and the leadership through compromising alliances and literally run down almost everything Nehemiah did. And how does Nehemiah deal with this? He came back again and addressed the problem. This will address in the last presentation. But today, we are going to talk about how to deal with the enemy when you are almost there. Take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. I guess by now, just tracking down the phrase, Sambala, Tobiah, Geshem, Ashdodai, just tracking them in the account so far, you discover the enemy is relentless. From the moment you are called and you step forward by faith, when you gather your resources, in fact, you can apply this to your business endeavor, your academic endeavor, whatever steps you take along the continuum, from the very inception of the work, all the way to the very end, the enemy never lets up. And neither should we, because we have enrolled in a great controversy. The enemy will be after us, 
and we must not give up either. Nehemiah chapter 6 is an attempt to use compromise and intrigue. Intrigue is a scheming, a secret plotting in order to discredit Nehemiah and halt the building's operation. Up until this time, Sambalat and his friends have failed miserably in their attempt to stop the people from working. And so what are they going to do now? They decided to concentrate their attacks on Nehemiah, the leader himself. So he paused his pursuit of the Israelites and he singled out the leader, Nehemiah. He tried to separate Nehemiah from the people and from the project so that he would attack him personally. If possible, he would eliminate him, kill him, or discredit him totally so that the work would not go on. We need to pray for our leaders. Any leader at any level of organization, we must pray for our civic leaders. We must pray for our religious leaders. We must pray for leaders in our homes, our parents, our fathers, our mothers. We must pray for them because leaders experience some pressure we know very little of unless you have been a leader. Leaders are often blamed for things they don't do or they didn't do. They are criticized for things they tried to do. They are misquoted, often misunderstood, and rarely given opportunity to set the record straight. If they act quickly, people think they are reckless. If they bide time, they are considered cowardly or unconcerned. All leaders experience this. But if you are a spiritual leader, the pressure is even greater because Satan makes it his target to deliberately target you. And if he can use deceit, he would use it. If he can use murder attempt to kill you, he would do so. And so today, let's watch as Satan moves. I pray that the Lord will give us insight in chapter 6 as Satan employed four methods to attempt to derail the work by attacking Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It reads, Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and there were no bricks left in it. Though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us beat together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Notice what stage of the building it was. We are told that the building was almost completed. The only thing remaining was the, the doors that needed to be put in. So the work was almost done. And that is when Satan hit. The enemies attacked with a whole new approach. We must be careful. When we think we have almost arrived, when celebration is in the air and there's this euphoria of accomplishment, that is when we are most vulnerable. That is why the Bible tells us, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. First Corinthians 10, 12. We are much more susceptible to attack when we are inflated by the illusion of success. We are most vulnerable after moments of success, after mountaintop experiences, if we are not careful, we are going to fall into the dustbins of the valley. The work was almost done. And the enemies 
hit hard, but the way they approach this, unlike in the past, where they laughed at Nehemiah and his team, when they attacked them physically, now they offered an olive branch. They said, come, let us meet together in the plain of Ono. If you read this chapter through, you are going to see the phrase coming together. Come, let us meet together. Come, let us meet together. You'll find it in verse 2. You'll find it in verse 7 towards the end. You'll find it in verse 10. The ultimate goal of Satan at this moment is, if you can't beat them, join them. He offered to cooperate. Up until this time, Sambala, Tobiah, and Geshem had been strongly opposed to the work. But now, they came and said, Mr. Nehemiah, we understand we have had misunderstanding in the past, but I recognize we are all going to stay in this region together, so let's put our differences behind us. And let us cooperate. Let's come together. Anytime the enemy offers you help to partner with you, to team up with you, watch out because he is up for something come let us meet together in the plains of ono ono o n o that's the name of uh, that that place ono was halfway between jerusalem and samaria so they are basically saying nehemiah let's let's meet you halfway you also meet us halfway so that we can have a win-win situation the invitation sounded good, but it was a dangerous ploy. You see, Ono was halfway between Jerusalem and Samaria. It was one day's journey to travel to Ono, one day's journey to return. And if they are going to spend a day for a meeting, Nehemiah would be gone for three days. And during the three days, they are going to hit hard at the home base. So it was calculated to distract Nehemiah away from the action spot. And then when he was invited, come, let us meet together. Who are they us? The enemies, because they all uh, were rulers of the four regions. And so there's going to be a meeting. Nehemiah, together with Sambala from the north, Tobiah, enemy number two, Arab, Geshem, enemy number three, and all the enemies number four. So if you are going to have a meeting, and it's going to be a democratic meeting, and we are going to vote, they would outvote Nehemiah. And so they knew he couldn't win in a meeting. But even if he held his own stubbornly and decided not to go along, and Nehemiah heads back home, they would plot an assassination, they would kill him on the way. Because if you read the account, the Bible tells us Nehemiah told them that, if you read Nehemiah chapter 2, come let us build together when they told him, but they thought to do me harm. They would have plotted his assassination on the way. And they will be the first to announce on CNN or BBC News or Fox News or whatever news channel. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with deep regret that we announce the death of our brother Nehemiah. He was such a patriot from our region. And then they will write a nice eulogy. Nehemiah grew up in Persia, in the diaspora. He was a foreigner over there, but he excelled so much, he rose to the highest ranks of society. And when he could have stayed there and enjoyed the fruit of his labor, he chose to come to our region to help us build and develop the area. Indeed, when he came, the walls of Jerusalem, his home country, was down. He helped to get it started. And Nehemiah was such a wonderful man, he extended an invitation to all of us to meet in the region. And we just had a good summit with plans in place. It is so unfortunate that Brother Nehemiah had to die tragically. They would have murdered him, 
But then they would announce it on the news as if it was an accident. Nehemiah knew what they were going to do. And so how did he respond? In verse 3, Nehemiah said, So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? See, a true leader must be courageous and must have his priority straight. In Nehemiah's case, it was God-centered and mission-oriented. Nothing less. I am doing a great job for the Lord. I cannot come down. That should be our attitude. When you are doing a great job, remain focused. Leaders refuse to be distracted. Remain focused. And that is what Nehemiah did. He understood that he should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Amos would ask, can two walk together except they be agreed? Leaders must know when to say no. They had nothing in common with Tobiah and Sambalat. And so he said, no. But you think they will quit. They did not quit. In verse 4, the Bible says, but they sent me this message four times. And I answered them in the same manner. So when they came, Nehemiah, let's meet together in the plane. He said, I'm sorry, I'm doing a great job for the Lord. I cannot come down. They went back again. He said, Nehemiah, if you can't come down at this time, let's give you two weeks rearrange. We will also rearrange our schedule. Let's all meet. Nehemiah said, I'm sorry, I'm doing a great job for the Lord. I cannot come down. They came the third time. I cannot come. They came the fourth time. Why were they repeating these invitations the same way? It is classic propaganda, classic pressure. Because there is something about human nature that the more you pressure someone, the more they eventually give in. I cannot do this. Well, if you love me, do this. Well, if you really love me, do this. If, after a while, they wear you out. And so Satan thought he could wear Nehemiah out with repetition. And as I said, in classic propaganda technique, you repeat error so many times until people start thinking error is truth. So today we have all kinds of lifestyles floating around. And we have repeated it over and over again until suddenly people think it is normal. Errors in the church. Practices that have no biblical foundation. We repeat it so many times, flash it so many times, go over it so many times, and people start thinking it's normal. Satan tried it on Nehemiah. It did not work. And God's people, leaders, must always say no. Because error is error, whether it is repeated five times or 50 times. Remember when I was giving this lecture to a group of students, one of them said, hey, Dr. Pippin, anytime Satan invites you into some compromising dialogues, tell him, oh, no. Using the word, oh, no, the village, tell him, oh, no. And then I responded, I prefer, come down for what? As a sermon title, come down for what? When you are bidding to compromise, to cooperate with people who are at variance with you in purpose, refuse to do so. By the way, we are not saying a leader must not compromise. There is a place for loving compromise and cooperation if there is a common purpose. If there are no spiritual and moral issues involved, if there are no theological issues involved, you can cooperate with others if your vision, your purposes are in the same direction. So there's nothing wrong with loving, cooperative compromises. But if you enter into partnership, cooperation, compromise, with the enemy 
whose grooves and goals are different, you can be sure that in the end, they will change your goals and they will change your values. If you want to cooperate or partner with others or team up with any, whether a company or individuals, you must ask, are they the right people? Is it the right time? Is it the right purpose? Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, whether in faith, in methodology, in marriage, or business. So they've tried it. Five times it didn't work. Now they are coming back with another ploy. This time it is a different kind of pressure, but they are going to use rumor and slander by fomenting or by, by accusing Nehemiah of fomenting sedition. He's trying to overthrow the king. Let's watch what they did. Verse 5. Then Sambalat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Let's just pause there. Notice this time, Sambalat sent his special administrative assistant, his servant. And he came with an open letter. Open letter, what's an open letter? An open letter is a letter that everyone can read. In previous times or ancient times, when you write an official letter to an official, a government official like Nehemiah, he was governor. You rolled it up, secured it with seals, so that only the authority to whom it's addressed can open it. But Sambalat and his gang deliberately wrote a letter, did not seal it, it was open so that everyone could read it. So as his servant was traveling from Samaria, coming downstairs to meet Nehemiah, everyone was reading it. It's like today, publishing some rumors about somebody, flashing it on internet or WhatsApp, or if you are sending an email, you send a copy to so many people. The goal was intended to pressure Nehemiah. Notice what he said, verse 6. When they had this open letter, the Bible says in verse 6, in it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, that you, Nehemiah, and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the world, and that you may be their king and that you have appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah. Now, these matters will be reported to the king. So, come and let us consult together. The same, come, let us build together. Now, they've twisted it to, come, let us talk together. Why? It has been reported. It has been rumored. We know it. Oh, by the way, enemy number, number three, Geshem says it is true that you, Nehemiah, the reason you are here is you are coming to rebuild this city so that it will rebel against the king. You are going to set yourself up as another king. And you've already arranged with some of these prophets in town so that they will proclaim you king. They made these stories up. There was no truth in it. And like most rumors, the source was not mentioned. It has been reported. Rumors have it that any time you start hearing it has been reported, they say, I have heard this, you know, know what it is. It is calculated to blackmail, to slander, to destroy. Somebody says that the number one threat in the unity of the church it's not drugs, it's not teenage pregnancy, it is not poor church programs, bad music, or even a weak pulpit. The number one threat to Christian unity 
is the tongue. The wagging tongue, rumors and gossip. And Satan is going to throw gossip and rumor at Nehemiah. And these were very insidious because Nehemiah is being charged with trying to plot a coup d'etat and establish himself. Something that has never occurred to his mind. And so the question is, how do you deal with rumors? By the way, anytime someone comes to you, have you heard, I've noticed this, do what Jesus bids us to do. Stop the person in their track. Tell them to go to that person and talk to them. If you listen to it, you are encouraging rumor mongering. And that will destroy you and destroy that person. Whenever someone says something about any individual or any groups of individuals, ask yourself, is it necessary? Is it confidential information that should be kept away from your hearing? How will it benefit you and benefit the person they are talking against? If the information is criticism, can this person I'm talking to help correct the problem? Do not entertain rumors or gossip. Proverbs chapter 6, 17 to 19 lists seven things God hates. Three of them have to do with rumors, gossip, or the tongue. So how would Nehemiah deal with this? This is malicious rumor concocted about him and splashed all over in the open letter to put pressure on him. And chances are, by the time he finally received his letter, the letter had made its way or was making its way to Persia to meet the king. How would Nehemiah deal with it? If I were Nehemiah, I would do what I do best. I would take a pen and write a 50-page response to every one of the allegations. But that was not how Nehemiah dealt with it. In verse 8, we read, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Notice, Nehemiah didn't worry about his reputation or how the king might react to this libel or slander. That is beyond his control. What did he do? He simply denied the rumor in one sentence. You know that what you are saying is not true. Sentence number one. You know that the reason you are doing this is so that I'll stop the building. I'm sorry, I don't play those games. Goodbye. And then he went. The Bible says he prayed to God to strengthen him. Not to take him out of the situation, but to strengthen him so that he could continue. That is how you deal with rumors. Don't waste your time denying the report. Pray for help. Go back to work. Ellen White has a statement that we might do well to pay attention. She says, we must give others an example of not stopping at every trifling offense in order to vindicate our rights. We may expect that false reports will circulate about us. But if we follow a straight course, if we remain indifferent to these things, others would also be indifferent. Let us leave to God the care of our reputation. He goes on, she goes on to say that slander can be lived down by our manner of living. It is not lived down by the words of indignation. She says it is weak trees and tottering houses that need to be constantly propped up. When you show yourself 
anxious to protect your reputation against attacks from the world, you give the impression that you are not blameless. Basically, what she's telling us, by the way, this is from Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1160, paragraph 9. What she's basically saying is, don't waste your time dealing with rumors. Leave it in the care of God and focus on your work. And that is what Nehemiah did. One sentence, it is not true. Second sentence, you made it up to discourage me from this work. I will continue working. Lord, help me. And he moved on. If you are a leader, expect people to attack your reputation with all kinds of rumors. Ignore them. Ignore them and trust your case with God. The enemy did not stop. Now he comes with another plan. Each new approach attacking the leader, he escalates it to a next level. From verses 10 to 14, the enemy who is relentless does not give up. He comes up with another plan. This time, he is coming to use false prophets. Shemaiah, Noedia, and a host of prophets. Let's listen. From verse 10. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you indeed at night they will come to kill you this is a very clever trap set for nehemiah shemaiah was a hiling prophet he was hired he was a prophet who had been hired by the enemies and what did he do? He shut himself up in his house and gave the impression that, like Nehemiah, his life was in danger. And so when Nehemiah went to see him, Shemaiah suggested that both of them should take refuge inside the temple because the enemy could not reach them there. Why? According to him, the enemies are coming to kill you. They are planning to kill you tonight. So let's go and hide in the temple. And this is coming supposedly from a prophet. What would Nehemiah do? Here is a prophet who is saying, the Lord has shown me this. The Lord has revealed this to me, that they are coming to kill you. Was it true that the enemies wanted to kill Nehemiah? Definitely true. Their track record indicates that. But was it? A fact that God has revealed to Shemaiah, Shemaiah that they are coming to kill Nehemiah that night and they should go and hide inside the temple. This was a calculated trap. Because what better place would Nehemiah want to be than in a place where he will feel secure in a temple? Doing what is his greatest joy, his source of security, prayer. See, Satan knew Nehemiah's strength. He was a man of prayer. He was a spiritual man. And so he calculated this attack. Nehemiah, you are a man of God. Let's go and pray inside the temple. The enemy would not come there. What do you do? When somebody comes to you, and says, the Lord has showed me this. I have had this dream about you. I have gotten this vision or this prophet X, Y, Z. And in Africa, we have a proliferation of prophets. And the word prophet almost sounds like prophet. And every day there are all kinds of prophecies. I should marry you. Do this work. What do you do when someone prophesies concerning you? What was Nehemiah's response to this snare that was camouflaged beneath false piety? In verse 11 onwards, we read, But I said, 
Should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save my life? I will not go. Let, let me just pause there. A few weeks earlier, Nehemiah said, I will not come down. Now he says, I will not go in. You think I'm a coward to run and hide to save my life? See, Satan sometimes puts us in a position where we feel we must save our life at all costs. Instead of being faithful at all costs. If saving our life at all costs is your, philo your ethic, then you are in trouble. We must not save our lives at all costs. What we are bidden to do is to be faithful at all costs. We must be faithful even unto death. You can only save your life when the means you use is consistent with Bible teaching. But you don't lie to save your life. You don't steal to save your life. You don't kill to save your life. Satan came with this ploy. Nehemiah, save your life at all costs. He said, I'm sorry. I will not go into the temple to save my life. I will not. Verse 12. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Nehemiah knew. He saw through it. He had the gift of discernment to know that this prophet who came in the name of Jesus was lying. How do we know he was lying? How did Nehemiah perceive that what he was telling him was not true? And by the way, Shemaiah was not the only one who prophesied at that moment, say, Nehemiah, go and hide in the temple because he's about to kill you. If you read verse 14, when Nehemiah was praying again, my God, remember Tobiah and Sabalat according to their works, and the prophetess Noedia, and the rest of the prophets, plural, who have made me afraid. So, in addition to Shemaiah, there were Prophetesses, one is mentioned, Noedia, and the rest of the prophets, they all ganged up together. They were all bribed to let Nehemiah follow their words and go and hide in the temple and leave the work undone. Nehemiah refused to go in. He knew it was false. I want you to see a leader, one man against a, a whole army of prophets. They are all saying the same thing. How did Nehemiah know that they were lying? They were false prophets. There's only one way he knew from the Bible. Because Nehemiah has studied scripture. Remember, when, when, when we read from chapter 1, even his prayer was all content-based, Bible-based. He knew from the Bible that if you are not a Levite from the tribe of Levi, if you are not a priest, you are not permitted to go inside the temple. You can only get as far as the outer court. But inside the temple, God forbade non-Levites or non-priests to go inside. If you read Numbers chapters 8, 18, Numbers 18, verses 7 and verse 22, the Bible says, anyone who is not a priest or a Levite who goes inside the temple must be killed. He repeats it. In verse 22, Numbers 18, they must bear their sin and die. That is why, you know, there was a certain king called Uzziah who went to the temple to sacrifice whatever and he was struck with leprosy and he subsequently died. Second Chronicles 26 from verse 16 onward. So I want you to watch this ploy. Satan deliberately calculated this so that Nehemiah would flee from the work he was doing for God. 
building and go and hide inside the temple and this would undermine his credibility all his followers say our leader is a coward they will get demoralized and then the enemy will come and strike it's almost like jezebel how he threatened elijah elijah tomorrow by this time after the mount Carmel experience I'm going to do to you what you did. And um, uh, Elijah was so afraid, he panicked and fled. He left his work. Elijah failed the law. Now the enemy has come again, using fear to force Elijah to run away and hide inside the temple. And the plan of the enemy was, when he enters the temple, then with all these prophets, he had ganged up and raised, they would now call in Nehemiah's arrest and execute him. What was worse? He would die in his sin. So the plan of the enemy, this was the most cruel, the most insidious. They wanted Nehemiah to die, to be killed, and not only die physically, because he would have disobeyed the Lord, he would have been eternally lost. That is what Satan is seeking to do. And today, we are living at a time when there is this proliferation of prophets and prophetesses. And you go, I have seen this, I have dreamed about this, and people will write to you, tell me the meanings of this dream, this vision, etc., this prophecy. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way you can know whether this prophecy is of God, this dream, this vision is of God, is by the word of God. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the prophets, referring to the Bible in those days, if they speak not according to this, there is no light in them. Whenever any prophet or so called man of God gives you any instruction that is contrary to the Bible's teaching, there is no light in them, period. The way you worship, the day you worship, who you worship, how you worship, all of these things, if their teachings are not in harmony with the word of God, there is no light in them. True prophets, true men and women of God would have their teachings consistent with the Bible. Anything less is not of God. Even if it's attended with miracles and supernatural to the law, and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this, there is no light in them. Scripture is our only safeguard, our safest course. Apostle Paul says in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, even if an angel parachutes from heaven and proclaims a whole brand new gospel, if it's not in accordance with what we have written in God's word, do not believe it. Nehemiah was spared his life, his reputation, because he knew God's word. And that was the only thing that safeguarded and shielded him. Because the pressure from these prophets was too huge to overcome. The word of God saved him. So we see the enemy. He tries one ploy. Come, let us build. It didn't work. Four times pressure. It didn't work. He uses slander, rumor, gossip. It didn't work. Now he with his hired prophet. It didn't work. Oh, by the way, notice how Nehemiah concluded that section. Verse 14. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat, according to the, these their works. And the prophetess Noedia and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. If you read the account, the plan of the enemy, whether he was using pressure, slander, rumor, deception, the ultimate goal was to make Nehemiah afraid. 
if, if you read the, the, the account, at least three times he kept saying, verse 7, the very last part, so they came to me so that they will make me afraid, verse, verse 9. If you read verse, uh, anyway, repeatedly, verse 13, so that I should be afraid. If you read on, at least I counted three, four times. The purpose was to make me afraid. How did he handle his fear? He committed his case to God in prayer. Lord, deal with these people. And then he continued the work. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. I hope you are beginning to see from day one, chapter one, when we met him, his first response to the plight of Judah, the walls are down, the gates, he prayed, he fasted, he continued four months chapter, up to chapter two. Even when the king was asking him a question, he prayed. I mean, he was a man of prayer. Repeatedly, in chapter 4, when he was being attacked, he prayed, he worked. He prayed, he worked. He was a man of prayer. You think the enemy will stop. No, he wouldn't stop. But watch this. Because Nehemiah was focused on his task, his mission, verses 15 and 16 tells us. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. The wall was finished in 52 days. A job that had defied attention for 164 years with a great leader in less than four months. It was done, 52 days. And verse 16 says, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Amen? It was done by our God. Nehemiah didn't, Give credit to himself. We managed to do this because of my strategic abilities. I got all the skills, the training, the university training, and all the job experiences in Persia. I came, I did this, I mobilized, I did, and that is how we got it done. No. The work was done by God. It was an act of grace alone. How a demoralized group of people who have never laid a brick in any major, no architects, no engineers, how they rally together under the most severe circumstances, external opposition, internal struggles. They managed to get the work done in 52 days. Even when their leader was under assault, being pressured, he got this work done. Grace and grace alone. And definitely the enemies and the nations around were disheartened because they had been plotting for years that the world would never be up. They were the people years ago who wrote to attack taxes in Exodus chapter 4, saying these people are going to foment trouble. Don't allow them to build. And that led to the king halting the operation. Now, the wall has been built. Mission accomplished. They were disheartened. You think they are, they are done? No, they did not give up. Even when mission has been accomplished, they never give up. After the wall was done, and tomorrow we are going to continue. Nehemiah will put structures in place. He will choose leaders. We'll talk about it briefly tomorrow. And he governed Judah, if it's capital in Jerusalem, for 12 years. During the 12 years, the enemies never gave up. So let, let, let's conclude chapter 6 and watch what happened. 
after the walls were down and Nehemiah started reigning and governing, etc., the 17 says, Also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. Who is Tobiah? Enemy number two. The nobles of Judah, these are the, 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 the leaders of Judah. They were communicating with enemy number two. They sent letters to Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. So apparently, because enemy number two, Tobiah, had one of his sons marry into one of the top nobles' family. They had an alliance. And so they planted these rulers of Judah so that when Nehemiah met with them, they were having meetings and discussions. They were relaying the information to Tobiah, and Tobiah was giving them information what they should do. If you read verse 19, also they reported his, Tobiah's good deeds before me, and reported my words to Tobiah. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. All through the 12 years, when Nehemiah was the governor of the entire Judah, and you can be sure he had to meet with the mayors and the city council leaders, the leaders of Judah. Unbeknownst to us, these leaders have pledged an alliance with enemy number two. So let's say they went for a meeting. While they were discussing issues, Nehemiah would say, ladies and gentlemen, we did not do it this way. The enemy is out against us. Let's do this. Anything they will say, these enemies will quickly write it down. And today they will say, they will text the message, you know, a quick text message to Tobiah. We are at a meeting here in, 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 in this hall. This is what Nehemiah is saying. What should we say? And then he will text them back. Some of them would say, okay, let me go and use the bathroom. And then they will go and call. Tobiah, this is what is happening. This is, can you imagine? Being in an organization when you have an enemy inside, a mole, as we call it, a spy. And these are some of the most trusted people in Judah. I mean, it, 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 it makes so much sense that any Israelite will form an alliance with enemy number two. But worse than that, these are People from Judah, if you know a, a little bit of your Bible, God had prophesied that from Judah would come the Messiah. And when we had people like David, King, Judah, Jerusalem, all of these, the city of David, all these were prophetic in the sense that Judah was given the right to reign. The kings came from the line of Judah. And the enemy said, I am going to infect that line. Bribe their leaders. Put them on my side. Then I can go after Nehemiah. Can you believe this? Satan never gives up. He is a relentless foe. But so should we. If Satan is so determined to derail us, we must, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit, charged with his word of God, we must refuse also to give up. This battle will continue. Call it the great controversy between Christ and Satan, and it is playing out in your life, in my life. Every day, Satan will come after you one way or the other. You make a decision. I want to serve the Lord faithfully. Even before you walk out of the church, Satan has a plan for you. When you go home, tell your friends, your relatives, now 
no more of this. I am now going to serve the Lord. You rally the resources you have. Satan will come after you. Whatever business, whatever decision, your studies, once you make up your mind and once you get started, he will be after you. Once you keep growing and you reach a certain stage halfway, he will come after you. Once you get almost to the end, he will come after you. If he doesn't put you down, laugh at you, scorn you, psychological, he will come after you with attack, sickness. You lose your job. He would inflict all manner of pain against you. I am very sure, even as we speak now, some of you are being terrorized and attacked by the enemy. You've lost your self-esteem. Perhaps you have failed so many times and you, you feel like, me feeble do, what can I do? Refuse to give up. Talk to the Lord. Hand the situation over to the Lord. And keep building. Keep building. Even if the enemy attacks you personally and treasures you, stay strong. No compromise. And when he splashes, rumors, attacks, gossip, anything to ruin your reputation, dust them off and keep building. But the worst area he's going to use is deception. And that is why we need to study the word of God. Because that is our only shield. The enemy is shrewd. He has studied you. He knows your habits. He knows what, what you read, what you sing about, etc., etc. So he will go and bribe people to use your language, come into your life in order to derail you so you disobey God. Refuse to go in just as you refuse to come down. There should be no compromise. As Ellen White says, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this is going to be our test. When others give up, he says, at this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others. Others when was cold, gather warmth from them and keep going. We must gather courage from the cowardice and loyalty from their treason. I hope the message is clear. We are living in the last days. And the experience of Nehemiah is going to be repeated. As I said on the opening day, Ellen White says in the book Christian Service, page 173, the experience of Nehemiah is repeated in the history of God's people in this time. Those who labor in the cause of truth will find that they cannot do this without exciting the anger of its enemies. Though they have been called of God to work in which they are engaged and their cause is approved of him, they cannot escape reproach and derision. They will be denounced as visionary, as unreliable, as scheming and hypocritical. Anything in short of, that will suit the purpose of their enemies. The most sacred things will be represented in a ridiculous light to amuse the ungodly. A very small amount of sarcasm and low wit united with envy and jealousy and impiety and hatred is sufficient to excite mere of the profane scoffer. And these presumptions Justice, sharpen one another's ingenuity and embolden each other in their blasphemous work on, of attacking God's people. Contempt, derision are indeed painful to human nature, but they must be endured by all who are true to God. It is the policy of Satan 
thus to turn souls from doing the work which the Lord has laid upon them. Christian service, page 173, paragraph 3. The experience of Nehemiah will be repeated. It is being repeated. The enemy has surrounded us, north, south, east, and west. He is watching, very relentless. But the good news is, just as relentless as the enemy is, God is equally determined and passionate to make you win. Nehemiah 2.20, the God of heaven will prosper us. He will grant us success. We have all the forces in the universe at our disposal. Satan got only one third of the angels, which means two thirds are on our side. For every 1,000 evil angels Satan would unleash upon us, God can provide 2,000 just to match them. And in addition to these holy angels who are on our side, God the Father is on our side. God the Son is on our side. Lord Jesus Christ said, all power in heaven is under my control. God the Holy Spirit, who is a special ambassador today with us, is on our side. You don't have to be afraid. When you are down, get up. Keep running. Don't stay down. Keep running. The enemy will go after you because God has tasked you with a great work. It is fruitful trees that have stones cast at them. So Nehemiah, don't give up. The enemy is relentless. You better believe it. He never gives up. Until you die, he will come after you. But the same vein, God is equally determined. And he has made provision for our success. Nehemiah, you will prevail. You will defy the odds. What has laid in ruins, what has not been accomplished, you will accomplish it. And it is going to happen in our day. I'm therefore very excited that you, the young people in Northern England, Linking up with your friends all over your continent of Europe and across the uh, Atlantic to the United States, to Africa, to Asia. You are networking together to be the Nehemiahs of these days. Refuse to be coward. Dare to stand. No compromise. We are living in the last days. And God, in his wisdom, has even allowed this current pandemic to slow all of us down, lockdown, we can now have time to study. And using technology, we can now reach one another without the barriers that have been raised by the Sambalats of our time. Go forward by faith. Refuse to surrender. Even if you are personally attacked, it is evidence that we are on the right course. Be faithful, even unto death. We are going to pray. And after the prayer, we'll listen to our theme song again. Let us pray. Ask the Lord to make you a Nehemiah. Because I'm sure you look at your life, the great controversy is playing out. It is. Every one of us. As soon as you have a burden on your heart to do something for the walls that are down, to do something for the Lord, for humanity, once that burden is on your heart, Satan immediately tags you. He will go after you. As soon as you decide to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, once that decision is made, he would go after you. But God is on your side. He will never leave you alone. He will give you the strength to go on. 
When you fumble, get up, keep going. When they deride you, they scorn you, they mock you, make fun of you as if what you are doing doesn't make sense, it is unrealistic, don't give up. Pray to the Lord, keep building. Even if it's physical attack, sickness, death, whatever Satan throws at you, you keep on building. There is a resurrection coming, so death should not be the cause for fear. When Satan plants confusion in your life, your home, when he hit you, financial problem, so that the whole place is in uproar, dare to stand. And when he comes after you personally, trying to isolate you from God's people so that he can will attack on you, refuse to give up. God is on your side. Even if you are surrounded by enemies and they are texting messages, plotting against you, don't give up. Heaven is on your side. Let the Lord give you the victory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this study. We thank you that all heaven is at our disposal. Provision has been made. Because of the death, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his ascension into heaven as our high priest, we can directly assess power from heaven for our personal lives and for the work you have assigned us. When we are confused and perplexed and know not what to do, Father, let your Holy Spirit show us the way clearly. When we are discouraged, lift us up. When we are perplexed, show us the way. When we are sorrowful, comfort us. Lord, be with us. Help us to be the leaders of our time. Raise up leaders in every field of study. That we shall be persecutors, set the tone to give glory to your name and the upliftment of humanity. Tonight, we thank you for what you have done. You are our only hope, but for you, we would have been consumed by the enemy because his strength and forces are far greater than we can, but for you alone. Because of you, we are safe. You are our hope. You are our peace. You are our joy. Lord, help us to make you the object of our utmost desire. Let this be our experience, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. From early in the morning till late at night, all that I need is you. And my only hope, my only hope is you. My only hope is you. My only hope is you. Yeah.
from early in the morning. 